so that's the um, and there are exper there are experiments called play deprivation experiments in which young animals are deliberately raised in a way that they are not um, allowed to play when they're young. And there are ways of doing this. It's been done with monkeys and with rats. And with rats, there are ways of doing it such that they have other social experiences but not play. Uh, the way you do this is you raise young you raise a young rats in a situation where they're raised with adults who don't play with the young. And there could be, they, they could also be raised with another young rat, but that other young rat is injected with a drug that knocks out play. So this is a non-playful <laughs> other rat. The, the, interestingly, the drug that is given is the same drug that we give to children to treat ADHD. Mm -hmm. In rats, it knocks out play. So you raise a, some of the rats with other rats in the are non-playful. So rats only play when they've got a, somebody who pl will play with them. So in that way, they don't play. But they will interact in other ways. They'll socialize in, in other sorts of ways. When you test these animals in young adulthood, the rats that have been deprived of play are emotionally crippled. You put them in a novel environment, and they freeze in the corner. They don't overcome their fear of this novel environment the way a normally raised rat would, or even one of these rats that was raised in the same way as this other rat, but it, it did have a playmate, it did do some play. That rat will show signs of fear at the beginning, but it'll overcome it, and it'll begin to explore the environment. You put these rats in with, you put a, a new peer, another, a stranger <coughs> in, a strange rat of about the same age and the same sex in with a play-deprived rat, and the play-deprived rat alternates between extreme fear and extreme inappropriate aggression, inappropriate, ineffective aggression, and doesn't learn to interact in any other way with this other rat, and really can't stay in the vicinity of that other rat. One of, one of the two is likely to be killed if they do. Most often, it's the play-deprived rat that does, because that rat doesn't know how to behave in such a way that the other rat can accept it as a as, a, as in any sense, uh, a colleague or a playmate. So, the, um, it, so, so, so this idea that play has an effect of allowing animals to overcome fear, overcome aggressiveness, is borne out in these play deprivation experiments. And, you know, we are doing play deprivation studies with our children at least in the United States. We are increasingly depriving our own children of play, not quite so fully as these rats in these experiments. So it's not at all surprising to me, shouldn't be surprising to anybody else, that when we deprive children of play in these kinds of ways, when we deprive them of the kind of play where they have to, where they are really taking risks themselves, learning how to overcome them, um, this kind of thing is going to happen. All right, let me move on to part B of the talk. Children are biologically designed to educate themselves through free play and exploration. I've looked at, um, I, I've listed on the handout three different lines of evidence for this point. This is really the central point of the talk. The children come into the world biologically designed to educate themselves. The first, the first line of evidence, which everybody can see, I hope, is that you, is a, is but comes simply from looking at little kids. Before they ever start school, before we ever start in any deliberate way of training them, think of what they learn. You know, of course, today we're pressured now even to train, try to train little babies, but that's pretty recent. And yet, children have even. You know, when nobody was trying to teach children anything before kindergarten, children, by the time they started kindergarten, had learned their whole, you know, almost their whole native language. They had learned uh, to use that language for all kinds of purposes, to please people, to annoy people, to ask <laughs> questions. They had learned all kinds of motor abilities, walking, running, climbing, and so on. And they had learned good deal about the physical and social world around them. Think of what a child knows by the age of five or six. That the child by the age of five or six knows a reasonably good portion of what 
the person will ever know. That was a lot. You can interact. You can have a real interaction with a child of that age because they know a lot. They've done that without anybody teaching them anything. They just picked it up. It isn't, of course, that they could do it in a closet. They, they picked it up. They need other people around. They need models. They need somebody to talk with. They need the experience of pushing things off tables to learn about gravity and so on and so forth. But they are constantly exploring their world and questioning their world and figuring it out and bu building models in their heads about the world around them. Now, I've had... Um, People, I've known people, uh, including people who should know better, tell me that that drive, that curiosity and drive to learn, and that great ability to learn ends at age six, <laughs> roughly. That, that somehow biology turns that off, and the nature of children biologically change. So I'm going to argue that with the next two points that that is simply false. If we believe that's true, if it appears to be true, I would say it's because that's the age in which we put children in school. It's not that biology turns it off and we turn it off. We turn it off by putting them in a situation where their natural ways of learning no longer apply. Their own questions, their own curiosity becomes a distraction and an annoyance in school rather than the force of learning. Play becomes something you do at recess if you still have recess in the school at all and it's not regarded as part of learning and it's in a situation where there's not all that much you could learn during that play period anyway. So we, and we, we deprive them, I'll argue in other ways too, in school of the conditions that they need in order to continue educating themselves. And then we say, ah, you see, they can't educate themselves once they reach five or six or whatever the age is. The evidence that I have, have that, that, that self-education drive continues full force right on into and through adulthood comes from, partly from looking at education in hunter-gatherer cultures. And let me try to be fairly brief here. A number of years ago, I asked the question, how do children in hunter-gatherer cultures become educated? How do they learn what they need to know in their culture to become adults? They have to learn a lot. I don't, won't go into detail on that, but it could be argued that if anything, they may have to learn more than we do. Um, we have a more diverse culture, but we don't have to learn the whole culture. They kind of have to learn the whole culture. Um, so a number of years ago, I read all I could find, and I continue to read all I can find about um, children's lives in such cultures. As you probably know, uh, hunter-gatherers, we were all hunter-gatherers until about 10,000 to 15,000 years ago when agriculture first emerged in some parts of the world. Um, and, and some people in very isolated parts of the world managed to survive with the hunter-gatherer way of life into the mid to late 20th century. And anthropologists went out and found these people and observed them and wrote about them. And um, so I read, looked into what they said. And all, there have been about three dozen different cultures fairly well studied by anthropologists in different parts of the world. And um, in addition, um, to supplement that study, I identified, I found, I identified 10 relatively prominent anthropologists who had devoted a fairly good portion of their research to the field and living with uh, an observing hunter-gatherer group, um, did a survey of them asking them questions about children in this group that they observed and how children learn and about play and so on and so forth. First of all, just a general statement about these hunter-gatherer cultures, even though these are, you know, some of them in South America, some in Africa, some in Asia, um, some in other parts of the world, even though the climates and geography differ, there are certain similarities among all these cultures, such that anthropologists sometimes use the term hunter-gatherer culture in the singular. There's enough similarity that they could talk that way. All of these cultures, people live in small bands of about 25 to 50 people per band. The bands are mobile because they move around to follow the available game and uh, vegetation. Um, the cultures are all are referred to by anthropologists as egalitarian cultures because 
they do not have a hierarchical structure within the band, and there's no, each band is autonomous from other bands in terms of how they're governed. They make decisions by consensus. There's no chief, no big man, um, no bosses, no employees, no underlings. As part of that egalitarian uh, moray, they don't tell one another what to do. They have, it's almost like a taboo to tell another person what to do. They have, they're interested in what other people do. They're certainly affected. And they may, in subtle ways, indirectly try to influence what other people do. So if somebody's being really, really annoying, they may tease that person about it, make a joke or a song about it in a way as to let them know in a, in a somewhat playful way, but still a, is still a clear and pointed way, you're really annoying us <laughs> by doing what you're doing. Um, so they have w adapted ways of when they really kind of need to modify somebody's behavior doing it, but they, they just don't make direct statements. You have to do this and can't do that. They, they um, and most surprisingly from somebody from the Western world looking at these cultures, this same attitude of non-direction applies to children. They don't tell children what they don't tell children what to do. They are incredibly indulgent of children's childish behavior. They believe that children know what they want and need. They believe that if children, a child starts playing with a knife or with fire, the child knows what it's doing. Um, you know, it's not that they don't protect their children in some way. So they'll allow a child to play with a machete, a two-year-old maybe, to play with a machete or near fire. And if you ask them why, they say, well, how else will the child learn how to use this? You know, the, and, and in some sense, we might agree. The earlier you use it, the more likely you're going to be able to be really skilled at using this. So they kind of understand that. But on the other hand, the poison darts, they keep way up high in the tree, so children are not going to be playing with the poison darts. A knife or a machete, you might get a burn, you might get a cut, but you're not going to kill yourself with it. But a poison dart, you should kill yourself with it. So they keep that away from, from the kids. So this is the way, um, this is the life of children. So if you don't tell children what to do, what are they going to do? They're going to play, they're going to explore. And when I say children, I mean, uh, I mean people from the age of four, because that's sort of when they graduate to childhood from infancy. That's when, up until about four, in many hunter-gatherer cultures, they're still nursing, and they are generally believed to not yet have enough common sense that you would let them run off with the other kids uh, without an adult watching them. By age four, they believe you've kind of reached the age of common sense, and that you don't need to be watched all the time by an adult. And it also turns out age four is about the age, I think by, it's not a coincidence, that's the age when Kids want to get away from their mom. They want to run off with the other kids. They're more interested in the other kids than they are in um, their own parents at that age. And that, I think, is universal. Um, so, so there's two conclusions that came out of my study of hunter-gatherer education. The first is that the children are treated with extraordinary indulgence. Their instincts and judgments are trusted. Let me just read three quotations to illustrate this from three different observers of three different um, hunter-gatherer cultures. So here's one. Hunter-gatherers do not give orders to their children. For example, no adult announces bedtime. At night, children remain around adults until they feel tired and fall asleep. Adults do not interfere with their children's lives. They never beat, scold, or behave aggressively with them physically or verbally. Nor do they offer praise or keep track of their development. This is an uh, anthropologist named Yomi Goso in South America who studied a South American group called the Paracana. But in this, in this quotation, she's referring to hunter-gatherers in general. This comes from a review article on hunter-gatherer uh, childhood. Here's another one. Uh, the idea that this, is, that this is my child or your child does not exist. Deciding what another person should do, no matter what his age, is outside the Yaquana vocabulary of behaviors. There is great interest in what everyone does, but no impulse to influence, let alone coerce anyone. The child's will is his motive force. And just one more. I've got a whole list of these, but I figure three will give you a sample of it to let you know this isn't just one person saying this. 
So here's another one. Infants and young children are allowed to explore their environments to the limits of their physical capacities and with minimal interference from adults. Thus, if a child picks up a hazardous object, parents generally leave it to explore the dangers on its own. The child is presumed to know what it is doing. So one of our questions in, our, in that survey of anthropology was, was in, the, in the culture that you observed, how much time, how much free time did children have to play and explore? And essentially all of them said, really all the time, from dawn to dusk. You know, you might expect a child to fetch wood once in a while, with them, but basically children are free and they are free, and I, as I also started to say, I think I didn't complete my statement before, when I refer to children, they're from four years old on to late teenage years. Some people have the mistaken view that teenagers used to be considered to be adults and they took on adult responsibility. Not true among hunter-gatherers, at least. Women don't even generally begin to ovulate in hunter-gatherer cultures until about 17 or 18. And they're not going to become mothers until they're about 19 or 20 or beyond. And they are considered to be children, just as the boys are considered to be children, even somewhat later than that. Uh, you're, you become an adult when you become a parent. Uh, that's when there's this sort of transition to sort of responsibility. Throughout your, er, at least throughout the early teenage years, you begin to gradually assume adult responsibilities. Not because anybody's telling you to, but just because you want to. You start to do it. And so you begin gradually, maybe in mid-teenage years, doing some real hunting, doing some real gathering, doing some real hot gathering, and so on and so on. Before that, you're pretend hunting. You're playing at all of this stuff before that. So one of our questions then, uh, beyond the question of how much free time they had, was what are they doing during this free time? Well, they're playing, they're exploring, they're lying around in hammocks, they're talking, they're visiting neighboring tribes. They're doing all the kinds of things that you might expect uh, kids to do when they are free. They're playing musical instruments. They're doing lots of different things. A lot of what they're doing, interestingly, looks like kind of mimicry of adult behavior. Mimicry of the very sorts of skills that they need to develop. So let me just read you a partial list of some of the things that anthropologists listed in response to this question. What did you observe children doing during play? Digging up tubers, fishing, smoking porcupines out of holes, cooking, caring for infants, climbing trees, building vine ladders, building huts, using knives and other tools, making tools, carrying heavy loads, building rafts, making fires, defending against attacks from pretend predators, imitating animals, which would be a means of learning to identify animals, making music, dancing, storytelling, and arguing were all mentioned by one or more respondents. Art, it's interesting that, um, that some of the anthropologists, and at least one of them really emphasized this, that he observed the children to practice arguing. They weren't really arguing, they were just playfully arguing. What they would do in hunter-gatherer cultures, you can imagine around the campfire, the adults who have to make these decisions by consensus are arguing out issues. And the next day, this anthropologist would observe children in their little play village that they've made, little huts, they make this play village away, far enough away that the adults can't hear them are mimicking the adults' arguments. They've remembered the words, and if an adult did a particularly bad job of arguing and got mad, they would exaggerate that, and then they'd all roll around on the ground laughing hysterically at how stupid that adult was. So that they are learning from the negative examples as well as the positive examples. Now, nobody is telling them to do Obviously, nobody's telling them to do. They're doing it away from the adults. They don't want the adults to hear this. This is something that they are motivated to do. Something in them tells them, in, in this world that I'm growing up in, it's important that I learn how to use a machete. It's important that I learn how to build a dugout canoe. It's important that I learn how to hunt and gather. So I'm going to play at all of these things. And it's also important that I learn how to argue effectively. So I'm going to play at that. You don't have to tell them that. They recognize it. So let me move on then to um, the question, all right, well, you know, this is all well and good for hunter gatherers. You know, maybe we evolved over the course of our long evolutionary history a biology of learning that works really great as long as we're living a hunter-gatherer life. 
But of course, we're no longer living a hunter-gatherer way of life. We now have a different way of life. And there are some different things we have to learn. I would argue that what we have to learn is not as different as what most people imagine it to be. The bulk of what you have to, a lot of what you have to learn in a hunter-gatherer culture is the same as what you have to learn in our, our culture or any other human culture. You have to learn to use your native language and use it well. You have to learn how to get along with other people. That's probably the most important skill that we learn. You can, you can live a happy life in a hunter-gatherer culture if you're a bad hunter. But you can't live a happy life in a hunter-gatherer culture if you don't know how to get along with other people. And that's true in our culture. You can live in our culture a happy life not knowing how to read. There are a lot of people who don't know how to read and live a happy life. You cannot live a happy life if you don't know how to get along with other people. If you don't know how to empathize with other people, if you don't know how to provide their needs because you can't understand their needs and think about their needs, you can't have a happy marriage, you can't have good colleagues in any kind of work that you do, you can't have friends, and we need all of that. We need all of that for a happy life. And, and so I would argue that a lot of what hunter-gatherers have to learn is the same as what we have to learn. But there's some differences. We have to learn reading, writing, and arithmetic. I'd argue those are kind of trivial. They're not that difficult to learn. Compared to these other things, they're not that difficult to learn. And, and yet, we can, are we justified putting children in a prison-like environment for all those years so that they will learn reading, writing, and arithmetic, and maybe a few facts that they'll probably forget shortly after they leave school? So that's just kind of talking from common sense. But what about from empirical evidence? The empirical evidence that I have that the hunter-gatherer mode of education, which is to let children educate themselves, will work in our culture, is that comes from my observations uh, over a long period of time at a school called the Sudbury Valley School. And the democratic school here in North Gilby is modeled after that school. The Sudbury Valley School was um, developed, uh, was, was started in 1968. So this is not a fly-by-night school. It's been around for almost half a century. It currently has 150 students, which interestingly range from age four to late teenage years. That's what I said is childhood, when groups of kids four to late teenage years in hunter-gatherer cultures are running around with one another. Um, it has about 150 students of age 4 to, to, and they're not segregated by age, they're all, they can go anywhere they want in the building. There is no tests, there's no curriculum, there's no assignments. The belief is, you provide the right conditions, children will figure out and learn what they need to know for life in our culture. That was the educational belief of people who started this school. There are eight adult staff members at the school currently. They are uh, there not as teachers. They don't call themselves teachers, though they, of course, do some teaching. But the kids probably do much more teaching of one another. But it's teaching of the kind that we all do. Every time we have a conversation with somebody, we are teaching one another. Every time I tell you something, because I'm so proud that I know this, I'm teaching you something. Every time I listen to you, you are teaching me something. Teaching is part of the human condition, but they don't define themselves as teachers. They don't see their job as in being sure that the children learn some particular set of content. They believe that in our culture, there's so many different things. There's, we have such a huge amount of knowledge and skills and different things. Are You can't teach everybody all of it anyway. So why should you choose some particular slice of it and make sure everybody learns that same slice? Why not just let them decide what they want to learn? Wouldn't that even be better for the culture? Because then you'd have diverse people. Our culture kind of thrives on diversity. You'd have some people who are really good at this and some who are really good at that. And they started at a young age because they could start at a young age. That was the kind of a philosophy of it. The other thing that was behind the people who started this school, the other idea, was, look, we live in a democracy. The United States is supposed to be the great democracy. And Danny Greenberg, who was one of the founders of the school, one of the things he said earlier on, which I think is true, 
was that our schools are the least democratic institutions that we have in America. They are the most autocratic, the most top-down. Well, is that the proper way to raise children to be good democratic citizens? Shouldn't they grow up in an environment where they don't just hear about democracy and cynically say, oh, that would be a good idea. Wouldn't it be nice if they um, grew up in an environment that actually practiced democracy? So the school, the school is structured as a participatory democracy. All of the decisions, this isn't like student council where you vote on how you're going to do the dances. This is, um, this is all the real decisions of, of the school are made of school meeting, including the hiring and firing of those adult staff members. You cannot stay beyond a year as a staff member without being re-elected to staff by at least a majority vote of the students uh, in the school. So that was the idea behind it. So the school operates as a democracy. The rules are made by democratically. They're enforced democratically, just like in the larger society. There's juries that get formed, but they're formed in such a way that there's always, at this school, at least one little kid and one middle-sized kid and one big kid and a staff member who's on the jury at any given point if somebody's brought up for violating the rule. Students are probably statistically more likely than staff members to bring people up, and staff members can be brought up, and they often are. If they, you know, if somebody was drinking coffee in a room where you're not allowed to have coffee, and some kid will bring them up <laughs> for doing it. So this is the way the school operates. It's been operating this way for um, almost half a century. It has, at this point, hundreds of graduates who are out there in the real world. My first study of the school many years ago was a study of the graduates. At that time, the school was smaller, but it had already been in existence for something like 13 to 15 years. I don't remember exactly. And there were some of the graduates who had done all of their schooling there. There were, at that time, about 80 students, if I remember the numbers correctly, who met <coughs> my definition of being a graduate of the school meaning that they had been at the school for a certain period of time, they had left at sort of typical graduation age and had not gone on to secondary school elsewhere and had been out in the real world for a certain period of time. So a, a colleague of mine and I, uh, David Chanoff was his name, located almost all of these graduates, almost all of them agreed to be in the study, and the study absolutely convinced me that school works as an educational institution. I was skeptical at that point. You know, let me be honest, the reason I did this study initially was because my son had recently enrolled as a student there. He had rebelled in public school and we found this school for him. I wasn't sure that this was a good idea. I wasn't sure about what he might be cutting off his options. So I began to want to talk to graduates and I decided to turn it into a formal study which I eventually published in the American Journal of Education. And that was sort of the turning point in my research program. Let me just to give you, a, first of all, um, let, let me just give you an idea from that study. I could give many other examples of more people more recently, but let me just give you an idea from that study of the kinds of things that students went on to. That what, one thing that came out of the study is that, first of all, I should say, everybody learns to read and write at different ages. Reading, writing, arithmetic, not a big deal. It's really not that difficult to learn. Kids pick it up. Today, they're picking up, they're picking up reading younger on average than they used to because the written word is everywhere. It's on computer screens. They're texting one another. They're picking up the reading almost like you pick up oral language. Um, so that's, that's not a problem. But, what, what was especially interesting in this study is the relationship between what they were doing as children when they were at the school. We asked some questions. What, what, were, what, what kinds of things did you play at? And what are you now doing as an adult? How are you making a living? 